Hello, my friends. Eric Feltis here, life coach, speaker, actor, and host of The Great Unbecoming. This is a show about stories of unlearning. What did you let go of in order to become the person you are today? And what did you gain and learn as well? This is a show about letting go of stories that no longer serve us and stepping into our own authenticity. It's about unbecoming what society says you should be and remembering who you are and who you are meant to be. So sit back, relax, and welcome to The Great Unbecoming. Hello, my friends. Welcome to another episode of The Great Unbecoming. You know, one thing I love about this show is I get to reconnect with people that I know well, which is really fun. And I also get to meet new people. Not only do I get to meet new people, but I get to meet new people that have talents that far exceed my own ability in their own uh, in their own craft. For example, uh, I can barely draw stick figures, and I'm talking to someone that can do much more than draw stick figures. But clearly, I don't know how to talk someone up <laughs> when it's a field that I'm not good at. So I'm going to rely on Anthony's bio. The man and the person in front of me is Anthony, and Anthony is a multidisciplinary artist residing in Albuquerque, New Mexico. They spent 20 years in advertising, doing illustration and concept design, was a partner in two design firms, and worked with most every major brand out there. For the last 10 years of that stretch, they started painting, uh, painting again and participating in shows across the world. Their style and themes have changed dramatically within the time, uh, within that time frame and without uh, excuse me, within that time frame now being a full-time artist for the last eight years good for you anthony continues to explore queer themes originally their work started as internal explorations landscapes that betray the emotional stages of their inner world uh, that shifted to an external exploration on their identities and the disassociated elements that makes up a person uh Expanding in this, the works became more abstract and disjointed. Most recently, their works have moved into a place of pure queer representation. And that's kind of how I uh, met Anthony on Instagram, which we'll get to. The visual voice that was never there for them as a child. I just love that. I want to read that again. It's the visual voice. The visual voice that was never there for them as a child. That really speaks to me. Queer people taking up space romantically in nature. These works are more sentimental, gentle, and soft, healing a part of themselves they long since forgotten. Anthony grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, playing in hardcore straight edge bands, skateboarding, and making close uh, and making close for the local skate shops. They came out at the age of nineteen and moved to Los Angeles at the age of twenty-one, where their design career blossomed. After ten years, they moved to Palm Springs area. Most, uh, most as an escape from LA, but still being close enough to get back for work if necessary. Uh, four years later, they moved to Sedona, Arizona, and three years after that to Austin, Texas. Along the way, uh, their little sister passed of cystic fibrosis, and uh, and their relationship of eighteen years ended after that. Both sending them in artistic directions in hopes of healing. And I would just want to pause for a second. We recently finished a whole series on grief. Uh, and by recently, I mean but by the time this podcast comes out, uh, a whole series on grief. And my goodness, I, Anthony, I can't wait to talk to you about how, how your art has helped you to process that grief. But we'll get there. Anthony has always considered their work a selfish endeavor um, to expunge the heart and mind of darkness and heal the soul along the way. Though they're, and they're, though they're eternally grateful that such endeavors have touched uh, others who can relate along the way. Now settled nicely in New Mexico, they have a, a new life, a new partner of seven years, a teenage stepdaughter, two pups, and a loving home and circle of friends. Life will always throw twists and turns, but they feel equipped to handle them with each passing year, slow healing, slowly healing the old and bringing in the new. Well, my goodness, not only are you a good visual artist, but you are a poet. That is the best bio ever. And also you are a much better writer than I am a reader. So thank you for your patience, my friends. <laughs> Welcome, Anthony Hurd. It's good to see you. I literally wrote that like the other night. <laughs> I know, I know. And and it go just go away. Go, oh, I just like here I can like barely write with chat GPT and you're like writing poetry. I've written I've rewritten my bio about forty eight times, so <laughs> I do get better a, at I get better at condensing it. That's condensed, Anthony? <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. Oh, you've frozen up. <sighs> 
Are you there? I lost you again. Did you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this has been happening weird lately. I like to say technology is homophobic, but you're here now. <laughs> and yeah, you're, you, you're, you're getting good. kind of pixelated over there. So I should tell you, Anthony, I'm pixelated on your end. I should have told you this before we recorded. But the thing about Riverside is it'll download all of my data on my computer, yours on your computer. This is why you can't close the screen until it's fully uploaded, because when we present it, it won't be pixelated. It'll be like okay. my best quality and your best quality. <laughs> but the funny thing about that, Anthony, is that like if I like you froze for a second, so I couldn't hear you. But because it takes your data from yours computer and mine from my computer, when it puts it together, it gets the best of both. So it's so the audience will be able to hear you and me. Does that make sense? Oh, so like it'll yeah. sound like we're like, I don't hear you. But the audience is like, why is Eric being awkward right now? <laughs> It's it's a whole the thing. Awkward pauses. What's with the awkward pauses? We're just pretty. Anthony and I are just staring longingly, <laughs> longingly into each other's eyes. Oh my gosh! I don't even know where to start. I, there were so many p places I wanted to pause. So I'm just going to throw it over to you, Anthony. We talked a little before we started recording, um, and I know you grew up in a in a in a in a household that I would love to hear about. And I'd love for you to share that with the audience if you're comfortable doing so, because I know everything you've done has inspired the work that you're doing today. Um, well, I grew up in a suburb of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I'm two years from 50 right now. So this is 70s and 80s. Um, it was a very different world, pre-internet access. And um, I... It was a kind of, I don't know, typical Midwest kind of white trash neighborhood. <laughs> um, my parents were um, basically my parents met because my dad got kicked out of Catholic school for selling drugs. And then he went to public school where he sold drugs to my mom. Oh, and <laughs> what a what a meet you, Anthony. I know it's adorable. And she was about eight months pregnant in the wedding photos with me. So, um, that's my, that's my origin story. Uh, mm -hmm. but I grew up in a house. Um, I had a younger brother and sister. My brother has Tourette's and my sister had cystic fibrosis and my mom had a crystal addiction for 10 years and my dad had a Coke addiction for nine years. Mm. So, um, it was a really strange environment to grow up in, knowing that I was like a queer boy and in a in a midwestern town, and and I was really aware of how um, wrong it was. I guess probably about the age of six or seven. Hmm. You know, I, I was aware that I was not allowed to be who I am where I was at the time, but from hmm. a very early age, I started like making plans <laughs> to get out of there. Like I mm. like to tell people I spent most of my childhood planning how to get out of Missouri. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I really did, you know, I put all my efforts into, um, creating things and, um, teaching myself skills. And I started a bunch of like zines and bands and a little clothing line. And, you know, I sold my artwork and, um, I was just like a little gay entrepreneur and I was it's like, saving money. <laughs> I know I was just saving money to get out of, out of Kansas city, escape Missouri. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had dreams of California because I, I did skateboard. So I was just always, um, jealous of the people who could skate like all year round instead of being frozen half the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it was, um, it was challenging because, uh, my parents divorced when I was about seven and being left with my mom who had all of her addiction issues, it really put me in a position where I had to be the adult at a really young age mm. and um, having two siblings that were younger that also needed additional care more than a normal child would need as it is um, that made it even more difficult and um, skateboarding was kind of the thing that helped me escape the reality of having to be an adult at like the age of 10. Mm -hmm. You know, it, um, it, it gave me a, a tool to get out of the house. It, it gave me places to go. It, um, it helped me kind of realize that there were 
there was a much bigger world out there, introduced me to a lot of art and a lot of music and a lot mm. of cultures that I probably um, wouldn't have known otherwise because, you know, being kind of pre-internet and being the Midwest, there just wasn't access to a lot of things out there. Hmm. Um, and not that any of that was queer, but it was just expansive. Hmm. So um, it, it it really helped me have bigger dreams and, and envision a life for myself beyond the environment that I grew up in. Hmm. 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 Beautiful. It sounds pretty queer to me. Queer, queer sounds pretty expansive to me. <laughs> yeah. But I, if I hear you, yeah, it's like I mean, there it, were it, things going on in Kansas city, but I wasn't aware of them at that age. Of course. Um, you know, it was like, I, I basically probably about the age of eight or nine, I realized that like being an artist was an actual option. Like you could do that mm. no matter how many people told me it wasn't. It was something that I knew people had done. Um, mm. And I knew about art schools and from probably like age of nine or 10 and I knew I was gay and I was like, okay, I just got to stick it out for like 10 more years and then I'll go to college in New York or San Francisco or LA and I'll come out and I'll have like a, a real life. <laughs> Wow. So, I mean, the courage it would have taken at a, as a 10 year old, because you also grew up in a, in a religious household. Can you touch on that? And I'll, and I'll, the reason I'm asking is because I grew up Catholic and evangelical. And I think around that time I knew too, I think most boys know they're different than other boys around puberty when you realize who you're attracted to. Right. But I just didn't, I personally, I grew up outside Chicago, so similar, Midwest, didn't know anyone different. I went to a Catholic school, virtually 90-some percent of the people I knew were white, but on top of that, everyone, no one I knew was openly gay. Um, so I didn't know anyone different. So how, I'm just, I just want to note the courage it took for you to recognize, to have that discernment that I am different and I need to get out. Um, yeah, okay, I, I did grow up... I wouldn't say that overall my whole household was religious because of the addiction and all that kind of stuff. I kind of think my mom just sent us to church to just like get us out of the house. Yeah. <laughs> so she sure. have like half the day to herself or something. Yeah. Um, I had an uncle, uh, he was a great uncle who was uh, a pastor at a local Baptist church. And, um, you know, I just found church creepy even at that age because um like i've always been very self-aware and um yeah. when i learned about god and religion and all these things i um i took a lot of it to heart i read the bible you know mm. i i i read it pretty sincerely and then mm. i would go to church and i would listen to the preacher tell his version of the same words that i read and it would be translated into what i considered to just be really dark and and a lot of hatred and there was just so much negativity that it utilized to try to control the lives of people mm -hmm. and and I couldn't have articulated that at that age, but I knew that what I was reading didn't sound like what I was being told. And, um, you know, as most gay kids did, I, especially if you grew up in religion, you know, I prayed not to be gay. I Same. cried not to be gay. Mm -hmm. I wanted this to go away. Yeah. And like a really scary and pivotal, pivotal, <laughs> pivotal moment for me was, I, I must have been maybe 11 or 12 and I'd been fighting these urges. I'd been, you know, trying to pray them away and all these things. And I just remember laying in bed and um, like accepting that I'm going to hell. Mm, mm. It's so and, abusive. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, being that young and just saying, well, okay, I've tried you know, for many years now to not be who I am. And it's obviously not working because this is driving me crazy. Yeah. And um, I remember just accepting, well, I guess I hope I have a good life because mm. I'll be burning in hell for eternity after this. And it was a real like, 
you know, to be like 12 years old and be like, fuck you, God, you know, it's really, it, it's, it's, it's not something that I think most people are able to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I tell that story to a lot of people, um, it sounds just like a really sad story and very harrowing. And, but to me, it was really empowering because the first time that I like stood up for myself and I'm like, okay, well, this is who I am. And I guess I will suffer whatever the consequences are for, you know, me being who I am. Well, it's interesting. I know I mentioned that we uh, have done a series on grief, but I'm hearing the grieving process in your story. I think that grief is something that all queer people experience and coming out of the closet, you let go of something that no longer serves you like a hetero lifestyle, like this idea of fitting in, like the idea of being like other people um, in order to make space for something that's new and, and more genuine and more authentic. And so the first stage, I mean, I'm not saying all stages happen for everyone in, in this order, but the first stage is isolation and also denial. And I think that living in the closet, denying your identity is something that we struggle with often. It sounds to me like you moved to that, that, that stage of anger at, a, at a, a much earlier age than a lot of other queer kids. <laughs> because what you're describing to me, I felt that fuck you, God, anger um, more so after I came out. For me, it was less directed at God, more directed at the people that used God and the Bible as a weapon against me and tried to deny me the love of God or felt like I wasn't equal to them, like the church, the evangelical church I left. But either way, blame is the discharge of pain. So whether we blame God or um, people, it's still that process of grief. Um, but thank you for sharing that, Anthony, because I think that that's a, regardless of what age that happens, I think it's a very universal experience that anger and i think it's necessary i think it's a necessary stage in order us to get to where we are yeah oh yeah i mean i've expressed that anger in many different ways over the years i mean if you've had conversations on grief grief isn't linear you right. know it, it it comes and goes at different stages in your life and you never know what's going to kind of trigger that anger um but there's there's been many triggers <laughs> If you hear me pause for a long time, it's because I don't know what's wrong with our internet. I don't know if it's me or you, but it's like every four minutes you freeze. And I'm like, it's so good. When I go back and listen to it, it's going to be mind blowing, Anthony. <laughs> so I don't want you to think that you're not. My, my internet's pretty good here. So I don't, I don't I know. I am too. Works. I'm going to have to call Spectrum. Oh, calling Spectrum is such a punishment. <laughs> I don't know about you, but like, there's nothing worse than I didn't quite get that. Are you yeah. calling about your mobile device? No, I'm calling for internet. Okay, television. <laughs> no, internet. And then by the time I get to like a very sweet person on the phone, I'm so angry, and it's not their fault. It's You're still it's- screaming, operator. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to. It. Do you know how many times I say? Do you know how many words the word representative is? Talk to a representative. <laughs> I get so angry at the robot. Anyway. <laughs> My partner uh, often, I don't know what, what it is. He, he's really into his gadgets, and he gets um, on tech support calls very regularly. And I always hear him like in the office going, representative. <laughs> Just gets louder and louder with every single repeat. I think that's something that we can all relate to. Grief (laughs) and hating to talk to robots on the phone. (laughs) Give me a person. Um, Okay. I want to talk to sort of a shifting gears a little bit, but I want to talk about, um, you mentioned anger. I'm curious first, has, in what ways has art helped you to express your own anger? If, if at all, does that show up in your work at all? Or when you were at that age? Uh, yeah, well, when I was young, my work was really dark. Um, it was a sign of like the music that I listened to, the things that I was going through with, with my queerness. It was, you know, a part of a lot of the cultures that I was in. I was in hardcore straight edge bands. I don't know if you know what that is. Um, straight edge is um, when you you don't do drugs or alcohol or anything. Most of them are vegans and vegetarians. I got into a bunch of trouble when I was 17. I ended up going to jail for a few days and I ended up being on probation for five years. Um, So when I got out of that situation, I had to change my life around so that I didn't end up in jail. 
Mm. And uh, so that's how I got into this whole straight edge scene. But it's hardcore music, and it's it's really angry and it's aggressive. And so I I was able to take a lot of those aggressions out through music and in playing in shows. And um, you know, skateboarding in itself, just the physical activity and the frustration that you go through trying to learn new tricks and the falling and everything, it's all pretty aggressive. Mm. And so I feel like I had a lot of outlets for my anger and my aggression um, when I was younger. So it didn't always translate into my artwork. And then as I got older, the way it translated into my artwork was in a much more sensitive way. Mm. You know, um, like I said in my bio, my, Mm -hmm. my first real stint of work was kind of these internal landscapes and they were very turbulent and explosive. And there was, you know, a lot of, um, movement and it was always, you know, mountains crumbling and skies falling. And, um, it, it was a a way for me to express a lot of my grief. It was a way for me to express a lot of my anger and, um, even just in the process of painting a lot of what I do, even still to this day is when I prep a canvas, I usually put like a, a background layer. It's going to, it's going to be some form of highlight or something when the painting is finished, but I get kind of aggressive with that. Hmm. Excuse me. I really like throw paint down and I, I make a mess and I get it very wet and thick and I, move it around and and then I kind of buff that out I could take a towel or a paper towel and I just kind of smooth it out and it's kind of like wiping my internal slate clean wow it's like let, let's get this stuff out and then we'll smooth it out and then we'll paint wow and um you know because painting the the actual process of painting for me is very peaceful and it's you know, you get in the zone or you get in the flow of things. And, um, I, I'm not, my mind isn't wandering onto other things about what's going on throughout the day. It's very focused on what I'm doing. So I don't need the distraction of whatever frustrations I walked into the studio with to, Mm. um, mess with my process of painting because it can of course, it, it, energy is en- energy moves. So it could yeah. show up just like with me if I don't set some sort of boundary in my own work um, between calls. Actually, it's funny, Anthony, you said that because you know I'm, I'm you know I'm a life coach. I work with gay men that have been spiritually abused. I hold a lot of space for a lot of trauma, and if yeah. I don't set boundaries and learn quickly how to switch between one call to the next to the next to the next, I have eight calls today outside of this interview and and i love it i'm grateful for it but if i don't take care of myself and let go of that energy or 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 find a way to kind of set a boundary between me and the people i'm talking to there's no way that i can help i know it's not the same but i i love hearing you talk about your process and your own not only boundary setting but it almost sounds like there it, it sounds as if it's therapy for you of helping you to get that out before you create beauty well, there are a lot of similarities in what you're saying, but in a different way. Um, like, I don't know if you know that much about tattoo artists, but mm-hmm. tattoo artists go through a lot of um, memes about like trauma sharing because mm. people are stuck in this chair for three or four hours and they start talking and they act like the um, tattoo artist is their therapist. Mm-hmm. And tattoo artists are finally talking up and saying, Hey, you know, like we're not your therapist and it's a lot to dump on like a random person that you barely know. Yeah. And, um, I think a lot of artists go through that too, especially if you have any like real visibility, like I get DMS all the time from people who share really great stories about how my artwork touches them or inspires them or, you know, whatever. But at the same time, I get a lot of people that share a lot of trauma with me. Yep. And I have to um, really stop myself from getting too involved because I can't no. take on everybody else's stuff. No. And um, and it's not my job. I'm not a life coach. <laughs> you know. Um, well, I I think that I've gotten to the point now where I kind of put 
things in my stories that I think, you know, whatever the saying is that we, uh, the advice we give is, is usually what we most need to hear. Yeah. So anytime that I feel that I have advice for somebody else, I don't give it to them. And instead I put it in their stories directed towards myself. Mm. And then if they relate, great, but it's not, a mutual conversation. I don't have to get tied to whatever their specific trauma is. What a great boundary and also way of helping yourself and also way of helping the general public versus just that one person. Because if one person's feeling that way, a lot more people are feeling that way. I've actually heard, so I've mentioned this in the podcast before, it's a term that my therapist introduced me to and it's vicarious trauma which it was a new term for me, but it makes sense if you put two and two together. We're used to hearing people living vicariously through you. Well, vicarious trauma is taking on the energy of someone else's trauma. I do that every, every day. I, I, I've yeah. heard that massage therapists do that. I believe there's so much we don't know about energy, but if you are touching someone for an hour and you are releasing tension because that, that trauma gets trapped in your body, over and over and over and over. I can only assume if you don't set boundaries, you're taking that trauma on yourself. Yeah. Um, dude, I, yeah, totally I have relate a teenage to daughter. So mm -hmm. like, oh gosh. I have to every day not take on her trauma. Right. <laughs> Whatever it is. Um, yeah. I have a drinking problem. I just spilled <laughs> my water. Yeah. But, but yeah, that's very, um, it makes a lot of sense to me because, um, like I'm very open about what I'm going through. I've been going through some medical issues recently and I've talked about it in social media. Um, but it's really difficult when you're going through something and you talk about it and it's almost like 20 people have to one up you on whatever's physically wrong with them. You think you know, that's people are bad. like, Oh, I'm so sorry. You're wearing a heart monitor. I have cancer. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Damn. The fuck? Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's really bizarre. Um, people want to relate to artists. I don't know what that is or why um, specifically, but people tell me a lot of things. Um, <laughs> they probably feel seen by you through your art. Um, yeah. And so they think that's permission. I, it's not the same, but it's similar. Uh, uh, same. I mean, the thing that the thing that it, no, we're totally off topic, but this is this is good. The thing that drives me crazy when people want um, advice from me, I, and I don't mean to be rude. I understand why people think that it's my job, but it's not my job to hand out band aids. I don't hand out band-aids. If you want to invest in yourself, we can talk about my 10 week program. You can absolutely take advantage of my free email list, my free podcast, my free posts that I post daily on Instagram. Um, that's great. That's all there for you, but you coming to me and I don't know you. And in the DMS, you say, um, I'm married to a woman. I've been married 20 years and I don't know what to do. Well, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I get that a lot too. I get people that are like not out. I mean, mm -hmm. over the years, even when I was in advertising, I was fairly visible and I was known in the design world. And I would get a lot of like queer designers that aren't out of the closet that would contact me. And I was just like, I'm not, you know, that's, that's not my place, you know, and, and I hate giving advice yeah. because I don't like receiving it. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> like, I, 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 per, I, at this point in my life, I prefer to learn from my experiences. And if I see myself in someone else, I can watch that from afar and I can gather what information I need from that and maybe apply it to myself. But I'm not going to ask them to, you know, interject their experience into mm. my life. Mm. And, and it's very difficult because even when, you know, young artists ask me to critique their work. I'm like, my opinion really doesn't matter. You know, you should do whatever the hell you want to do. And the fact that you're asking some, you know, random stranger to critique you just tells me you're really insecure about your work, Ooh. which is fine. We're all insecure about what we're going through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe talk to your therapist. Well, even that, that's something that drives me crazy too. Cause I have people that will talk to me about their therapy and they'll say, 
I just wish my therapist would tell me what to do. Or like I, I asked my therapist their advice and I'm like, that's not their job. That's not their job. It's not their, their job, job either. Not to give you advice, their nope. job. Cause even my daughter, when her therapist tells her something that sounds to me like she's telling her what she should do. I'm like, that sounds unethical. Like, mm -hmm. and yeah. I, I, and then, and then I come to find out that's not really what she said. That's just the interpretation, the interpretation. of what she said. Sure, sure, um, sure, sure. Cause I'm just like, that's not what therapy is for. <laughs> They're there to listen. They're there to guide you on your own internal journey. They're not there to tell you what to do. Mm. Yeah. I want to, I want to, say something real quick before we move on. And then I want to bring it back to you because I think it's important. I want anyone listening to know you can always DM me. Okay. I want to make very clear because not, not Anthony. He's not a life coach. If you are you struggling, me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. if you are struggling and I, and I, and I'm not, and I want to be very clear with my message here. I'm not shaming closeted men for being married to women. I have a couple of clients who are married to women still. I have clients that have been married to women. There's no shame here. Um, the difference is if you message me for advice, but you don't really want to change anything in your life, I don't really want to work with you. But if you want to make a big change and you're willing to do the work and you want a transformational experience, not a Band-Aid for cancer, not a temporary solution to avoid the discomfort that you're feeling, but you're ready to do the work, then let's get going. I want to be clear. That's the difference. It's not about the circumstance that you're in. It's about your intention. So once again, if you want to avoid what you're feeling, um, go somewhere else. If you want to actually change your life and live your best life, talk to me. I'll tell you, one of my favorite uh, things, one of my old therapists, former therapists said to me was, Eric, I'm not here to make you feel better. I'm here to make you better feel. And I love that. All emotions yeah. are good. We're not going to avoid emotions. <laughs> yeah, I think my favorite therapist... <laughs> it's funny when you get to an age where you have a favorite therapist. Oh, out of oh I know. Of I have you have so many therapists. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite therapist was really empathetic. And this is when I was going through the end of my 18 year relationship. And I was just a disaster. Um, you know, when you've been with someone that long, it's really hard for your whole identity not to be wrapped up in another person. And wow. so I was unraveling everything that I thought I was that involved another person. And this therapist would start crying listening to my stories, not bawling, but tear up. And he, I, I said, I'm sorry. I don't mean to make you cry. And he said, no, I'm crying for two reasons. One, because your story is sad. It's hard. And two, because I'm acknowledging that you understand it. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that you're growing through so much pain is very, endearing and it brings me to tears wow and i was like wow okay you know that's i've had therapists that look at me like they don't give a shit too <laughs> you know yeah um, yeah but he never he's that that same therapist though never tried to push me in a direction they just always helped me hmm. um know i was kind of going the right way hmm. Yeah, Brene Brown talks about this a lot. She's like, you know, if you find yourself polling is the word she would use. In other words, asking people for advice. Should I do this or should I do this? Chances are you're avoiding the answer that's within. So yeah. whenever I find myself asking one, and I think there's there's also something to be said about like having a confidant that knows you very well, having a partner. I'm not saying asking for advice is always bad, but maybe ask yourself why you're asking for the advice. That's Asking random question. strangers is yeah. probably bad. On the internet, probably not. <laughs> Why would you trust Anthony? You could be a I, serial yeah, killer. <laughs> yeah, you don't know anything about me. It's almost as weird as me asking him to be on my podcast before I've talked to him before. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> hey, I saw your post. Will you be on my podcast? Literally, literally that's all it was. And I was so delighted <laughs> that you said yes. Um, I'm not asking him to marry me, y'all. Um, <laughs> yet. That's at the second post. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I just want him to paint me like one of his French girls. Um, so <laughs> I'll be his muse. Um, you know, I, I want to skip forward a little bit. You know, I know see, now I'm feeling like this episode should go in the series of grief, which is, I think, a beautiful thing. Um, 
one of the stages of grief is is acceptance and there's been an additional stage added which is finding meaning which we don't always get to we don't always get to acceptance either but i love that can you talk about how your art either and i it's maybe like what came first the chicken or the egg either talk about how your art has helped you to facilitate the acceptance and finding meaning in your queer identity and or how uh you've expressed your acceptance and your meaning through your art does that make sense yes okay yeah that makes sense. it didn't make sense um, to me so i'm glad you got it <laughs> i heard the words coming out of my mouth i'm like i know some of it's really here. complicated yeah yeah some of it's really complicated because the things that i learn and the things that i accept and the things that i process through my art much like grief aren't linear Mm -hmm. And so I don't always know that what I'm painting or what I'm experiencing in the process of that painting is some form of acceptance or healing at that time. Sure. And so sometimes I look back at a, at a painting or an experience or whatever, and, and I make that connection that I hadn't seen as I was going through it. And then other times it's quite literal, you know, it was like, Back in when I was doing the landscape paintings, I did this piece um, called um, The Veil of Impermanence. Hmm. And it was one of the last big landscapes that I did because it was kind of like me closing this chapter. It was like accepting that everything is impermanent and, hmm. you know, nothing is forever and that in some shape or form, there's always a, a lesson in it as much as we hate. I mean, we hate to hear that everything happens for a reason mm -hmm. because you can't fathom, you know, so many horrible things in the world happening for a reason. Mm. Um, but I think really what that means is that there's something to be gained or learned from even the worst of the experiences. Mm. It's, it's never that, you know, we wanted horrible things to happen to you. It's just that some growth, needs to be facilitated through pain hmm. there's no other way to have that experience wow and when i'm when i was doing that work it evolved into the next thing and this is when it became more abstracted and kind of it was me accepting my identity more but it wasn't an overly um obvious gay theme or queer theme it was more just how i was processing my own things sure and so i was really exploring like what makes a human a human you know like what makes us what is it a face is it an eye is it a head is it a body like can you disassociate all of those elements and still recognize it as a human you know are we our beauty or we are our failures or you know are we the ugliness that surrounds us i just i wanted to explore everything really abstractly and that was all kind of a way of a way of me it's like gathering the pieces of me mm -hmm. and realizing if some of it falls away or some of it comes back i'm still me Hmm. And, and none of that, even none of the expression itself can take away from who I am. Hmm. And so those full, those first two big parts of my work were probably like the most, uh, transformative, introspective, all that. But I don't think anyone could, would really see that. I don't, I, I think a lot of people would see it. They're like, Oh, it's cool. You know, it's interesting. All these things are going on, but they didn't, they might not have really understood what I was going through or what I was, um, experiencing and, and working on that work. When I got to what I'm doing now, it was interesting because, uh, I just had a big show in LA in January and I drove out and I visited friends along the way and, stopped in Joshua tree and stayed with old friends that I hadn't seen in many years. And, um, you know, when you're on the road by yourself, uh, there's just something about road trips. Like you have this space that you don't have in the rest of your life where you, you just have time to think or sort, you mm -hmm. know, or you're just listening to audiobooks or music. And, um, I, I came back from that show thinking I didn't, 
express what I wanted to express in that show. Hmm. And in that drive, I was listening to a bunch of audiobooks, and um, I don't I don't remember which one specifically it was, but it was the the typical conversation of you know healing your inner your inner child. And so I'm I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking, oh God, you know, like the level of trauma that I have as my child, my inner child, is probably so high. I don't really know where to start on that, and I just thought, just what is the one thing that would have made me feel better? as a child mm. just, one, just one thing you know i didn't care if it was chocolate i didn't care if it was you know holding my grandma's hand i just thought what was the one thing that would make me feel better and i thought like romantic queer representation would have made me feel so much better knowing that there was like a future for me mm. because I think something that's so hard for gay men or queer people in general and, and I don't know if it's different you know because of the way times are changing but when I was young um, when you think about sexual experiences they're not romantic mm. because you don't think that you're worthy of romance so you think about sexual experiences as being used or transactional somebody or you know somebody being drunk enough to have sex with you or yeah. desperate enough and so there's like all these mind games that you've played with yourself through your whole adolescence on just trying to figure out like what situation would actually make sense for you to have a physical connection with another person none of that for me ever involved romance hmm hmm because there was no romantic representation. There was never a queer couple couple on television. Right. You know, if there was any queer representation, it was, you know, the comical sidekick, overly flamboyant, almost asexual at that point, because, you know, there was no relation to that person other than them being a, a, a comical. Or they, know, were the I mean, well, they, they were the villain. I mean, they were the villain or they were dying of AIDS, you know, yes. and, mm -hmm. and, you know, when I came out, AIDS was still very prevalent. A lot of people were dying. I came out in Kansas City and I worked in gay bars for the first two and a half years of my out experience. Mm. And I watched a lot of people die. Hmm. That became the representation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of what queerness was. Will, will you live to have a long romantic relationship? I don't know. Hmm. You know, it was it was pretty harrowing to try to think about what a future was because mm. you didn't have very many, very many representations of a future at all. Yeah. And so I started painting these couples and they ended up being these Southwestern scenes because I live in the Southwest and I thought what's more romantic than, you know, a country Western <laughs> you know, classically. Right. You know, there's so many like American movies that have these big romantic love scenes through uh, Southwestern scenery. And I just like the idea of like queer people taking up space in nature and having a safe place like that in itself. You know, there's we talk about safe places a lot in, mm -hmm. in queer culture, but. You know, a safe place can be a person or it can be a location or it can be a feeling or it can be mm. your own confidence or, you know, whatever. But I, I wanted these paintings to feel safe. Like it was okay for them to have this moment when they're having it, where they're having it without fear of, you know, I mean, I don't want to go into all the things we can fear in the process, but, right. um, I don't know if I'm totally off topic from what you would ask me at this point. <laughs> Not at all. I mean, this is, you already, you, you very gracefully led us into kind of that finding meaning to me, at least for me. And this is where you and I met because I saw your art. God bless the algorithm. I saw your art and you used the word soft in your bio. I think that's a great word for it. I, the word I'm using is vulnerable, safe, um, calm, serene, romantic loving and just men embracing one another which is not something that we see and i see that and i feel seen 
And I also, what I love about it is you're, I'm assuming you're intentional about this, but they don't all look like me. They don't all look like you. Um, you because not all gay people look like us. <laughs> not all queer people look like us. So even when people don't look like me, I still feel seen. And um, it just shows me that how much I also have been missing feeling seen growing up and how much I needed that. It was a thirst that is quenched more and more because of people like you. Well, one thing I will say is growing up in Missouri, I literally lived in an area where we would get letters in the mail for recruitment for the KKK. Hmm. So, you know, I had really racist grandparents, um, you know, loving, amazing people, but racist is all get out. That's how they grew up. There's no excuse for it, but I think embedded in the queer community, there was a lot of racism. Mm. You know, there, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, no fats, no femmes, no Asians, Ex no yep. whatever. So no, for me, so that's just preference. No, it's not just <laughs> yeah, your preference. preference. Yeah. But I can't, I can't in good conscience say that I haven't been a part of that at some point mm, mm. that I haven't thought that, that I haven't been so involved in a community that I thought, well, it's okay to just state your preference that I just don't like these certain types of people. Mm. And a, a big part of this healing thing of my inner child and representation and all this stuff is also that like, I need to see other couples representation. Like mm. I need to see two black men in a gentle, loving embrace. I need to see old couples. I need to see young couples. I need mm. to see every different race and size and shape. And, and honestly, it will likely expand beyond it being people who represent themselves as male. You know, I, I would like to paint something that has more femininity and that has more non-binary representation that has um, more gender fluid um, but for right now, for me, I needed what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it'll, it'll evolve as it evolves, but, mm. um, I, I felt like my inner child needed to see these different types of couples. Well, I know mine did. So, you know, that if, if yours does that, you're not alone there. And I think that's what's so beautiful about what you do. So Thank you for listening to what you need and for trusting that and for sharing that with the world. What a gift, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. This it hasn't has been, been easy. So fun. No, <laughs> it's not. I told you I can barely draw stick figures, <laughs> let alone pour well, my I own. I don't mean the painting. I know you when don't. When I first Steven. started doing it, it was really vulnerable and scary sure. to me. And I was making a major shift in my work. And so I had a big following for what I was already doing. And then all of a sudden I'm like, Hey, here's guys kissing. And you know, some people were like, what the fuck you were doing? Like skeletons like two weeks ago. I remember and that, yeah. <clears throat> so I had a number of comments that were not nice. And Bye. there were, there was some trolling and some things going on. Most of that has completely faded away. Yeah. Um, but, when, when I'm being that vulnerable and I'm putting out this new work that is very sensitive to me and very um, close to my heart and everything, and and then I get a response like that, it it kind of really put me through the <laughs> the emotional ringers there for a second. Oh yeah. Um, but it has already healed so much because it's already so much easier just months later. Like, You're also describing like the idea of belonging versus fitting in. Belonging is, this is who I am. I trust who I am. And those who value my values can gravitate towards me. I recently stopped reading the comments because they were really bringing me down. Best thing I could have done for myself. But I remember when I switched over from just being an actor, content creator, to being this life coach in this specific niche, I remember getting comments of like, well, you just lost a follower. And I was like, okay, bye. <laughs> Thank you for leaving yeah. more space for more loving people. Like, don't let the door kick you on the ass, you know, hit you in the ass, but come back if you want to be a little more loving later on. Like, like I'm supposed to be offended or shook by the fact that you're a homophobe. Yeah, I, that's, it's just always the most passive aggressive. <laughs> I just wanted to walk into your <laughs> fine establishment to tell you that I'm not going to be eating here. Okay. Yeah. You yeah, could have just not someone, come. <laughs> I had someone do that. I had someone 
come, I, I did an open studio with my new work at my space and somebody came into the gallery, drove here, parked the car, walked in just to tell me that they don't like my new work and that they don't think that this should be visible to the world. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I just said, that's nice. You're not welcome here. Okay. Bye. <laughs> so Thank you so much. We said at the beginning of the show in a different context that blame is the discharge of pain. And I feel like on one hand, go F yourself. On the other hand, so much compassion, so much, I have so much compassion, so much pain that is so intolerable that you feel the best thing to do with that pain is to purge it on an artist as opposed to reflecting and realizing that maybe, maybe it's internalized homophobia, maybe it's fear. Regardless, it is not Anthony's to hold. But what yeah. a what a scared life they're living. Yeah. I try to keep that perspective a lot, honestly. You know, it's like dealing with my teenager. As much drama as she might have some days or whatever, I just always have to remind myself she's a child. Mm. And that she's still learning. And, you know, I think part of growing up is you almost have to like demonize your parents on some level so that you have a reason to leave the house. <laughs> so you have a reason to grow beyond where you are yeah. and like get out. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I watch people that are really hate filled and homophobic and, you know, it, it's such a cliche in the gay world because we've known forever that the biggest homophobes are usually queer. I was like, I, I and, used to be like, I get it. I get where that's coming yeah, from. Yeah, 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 we all that was our beard. Like, I used to hate me school. too. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'll get there. You'll get there. <laughs> well, that's. I mean, I've told people many times when they've said negative things to me. I've said, you can't possibly say anything more negative to me than I have said to myself. Yeah. It's impossible. Yeah. Just say thanks I know for the me feedback. better than you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to talk to the manager? Hold on. You yeah. stay right there. I'll go get them. Don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, Anthony, you never know when you haven't talked to someone before, but my goodness, did this conversation flow. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Now, I will put everything in the show notes, but I want people to see your beautiful work. So how can people either see your work or reach out to you about your work, not about their trauma? <laughs> you froze up, so I didn't hear that. Oh, no. I said, how? <laughs> of course, you were smiling. I had a feeling. I said, yeah, was, how, this was great. <laughs> I'll put this in the show notes, but how can people reach out to you, not about their trauma, but about your work? Um. I'm fine with DMs. Okay. You can find me at, at Anthony Hurd on Instagram, or you can email me through my website. Um, I there's no real limitations. Just you know, don't don't dump all your trauma on me. <laughs> right, right. And that Hurd is H U R D. So I will put his Correct. website and his Instagram handle in the show notes. Um, and hopefully you will get uh, more work and appreciation that you deserve. So thank you for being you. Thank you for expressing you to the world. Thank you for making the world a more loving and a more beautiful place, Anthony. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you so much. And y'all, we will see you next week. Um, as a side note, my friends, if you want any information about what I do, about my 10-week program designed to help gay men free themselves from church shame, you can DM me on Instagram. Don't DM me about art. Don't DM Anthony about your trauma. Flip it and reverse it. Uh, Eric Feltis on Instagram or Life Coaching by To make any appointment <laughs> with him, DM me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's not cross-contaminate. All right, y'all. We'll see you next time. Bye.